Are you letting the Holy Spirit lead you in your life? Hello, I'm Eric, and I'm here to help you to discover biblical truth and to apply it to your life. Now, in this video series, what we've been doing is we've been looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And that's what the fruit of the Spirit is all about, is these are the products of what happens when you let the Holy Spirit lead you in your life. Now, what are the fruit of the Spirit? Again, we've had videos discussing all of them, but they are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then Paul kind of rounds off the list when he says this in verse 23, against such things there is no law. And so that points us back to the, con to the context of what we're doing. Now, I'll do a fuller treatment of the context in the introductory video to this series, but the whole context here is, is, is Galatians chapter 5. And the idea here is Paul is arguing that Christians are to be free. Over in verse 1 of chapter 5, he says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. And he goes on to point out two ways that we can go back into slavery. And one is the that idea of legalism, where we, we start to live by all sorts of rules and, and regulations. And it's all about the checklist of doing things and not doing certain things. And we can become a slave to that system. And then he goes on to talk about the other way that we can go back into slavery, and that is license. That is doing whatever we want whenever we want to do it, because we are free. And Paul says, no, we're not. That, that's not true freedom either, because then you become a slave to your flesh. You become a, become a slave to your desires. The Christian is to live accord to, according to the Spirit, to let the Spirit lead us. And, and, and Paul talks about all of this in Galatians chapter 5, and he contrasts this, this fight here we have in our flesh between what our flesh wants us to do and what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. And whoever we listen to, that's the one we're following, and then there's going to be results in our lives. Uh, the flesh has its deeds, and Paul lists those over starting in verse 19. So if you're living according to the flesh, you're, you're living according to the, the fleshly desires that you have. It's going to look like this. You know, the, the deeds are evident, he says, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, Paul says. That's what it looks like if you're living according to the flesh. You will see it lived out in your life. You will see these sins and see these things happening in your life. But if you're living according to the Spirit, well, the Spirit is going to produce the fruit of the Spirit that we've been talking about. And Paul rounds it out this way in, in this part of this paragraph. He says this, after he talks about the fruits of the Spirit, after he talks about this conflict, he says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now, in talking about this, Paul, Paul is saying, if, we're, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, you have crucified the flesh and its desires and passions. You have put it to death, right? That's what he's talking about. And this is like a, a past tense. This is an action that's happened. When you trust in Jesus, what you're doing is you're, you're talking about it this way. Now, so if you've put to death the flesh... You know, it's kind of like you're, you've reckoned it as dead, and that other passages talk about it like that. Then you should be listening to the Spirit, right? And that's what he talks about in verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, Paul writes, let us also walk by the Spirit. So, so the grounding idea, the reason Paul is able to say what he says, is he says, first of all, we live by the Spirit. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, is who gives us life who brings us new life, who, who regenerates us and brings us into the family of God and gives us the new life that Jesus promised us. Life and life abundant. The Holy Spirit is the power. He's the one who give, empowers us to live the Christian life. If we are alive by the Spirit, if we've been made alive by the Spirit through Christ Jesus, if we are living according to the Spirit, then we will be walking by the Spirit. And this is the action he says. If we live by the Spirit, then let us walk. And that word for walk here, it's not the same word used earlier in the chapter. This is a different word. This one means to, to, to follow along with, to walk in the steps of the Spirit. 
So we're letting the Spirit lead us. We are following the Spirit. We are walking in the Holy Spirit's footsteps. That, that's the idea portrayed here. Now, for the Galatians, Paul had something very specific in mind when he's talking about this. He brings it home to them in their situation. And he starts doing this in verse 26. He says this, Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. So they may have had a problem with this arrogance and this boasting. And Well, I'm better spiritually than you. The Corinthian church had this problem as well. And so Paul is telling them, you know, we shouldn't be boastful. We're living by the Spirit, not according to our own flesh. That's, that's fleshly. We don't need to live like that anymore. We've crucified the flesh. We need to live by the Spirit, walk with the Spirit. So we're not challenging one another. We're not envying one another. We're not boasting or anything like that at all. Now, now Paul goes on to talk about what it looks like for the Galatians. And so in, this is captured in verses six, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. So I just want to share that with you briefly here. Paul writes, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one of you looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. The one who has taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. You know, just to kind of capture that idea, you know, this is, this is what it means to, to not become boastful, to not challenge one another, to not envy one another. Hey, if you see somebody who's struggling, you help them, you know, and, and you got to be careful to look at your own self. You know, you're not above uh, being led astray. You're not above falling and messing up and doing things like that. None of us are perfect you know, to help one another out here uh, and, you know, take care of yourself. Don't just be a bum, right? You need to work on and do stuff on your own. But and if you see somebody struggling, you help them. Just like if they see you struggling, they should be helping you. And, we're, and there's to be a sharing going on, a sharing of life, a sharing of resources, you know, to those who are in need. And, you know, sowing according to the spirit, not according to the flesh, right? And that's going to goes back to what he's talking about. If you are basically... Paul is saying, when he says, if you sow according to, you know, the flesh will reap corruption, when he says the spirit will reap eternal life, Paul is saying, if you practice those things, those deeds of the flesh, if that's what you're putting out there, well, you're, you're just going to get corruption. You're, it's just, it's going to keep going downhill. It's that spiral that's going to ruin your life and every, and the, it'll affect all the lives of those around you. It will corrupt your life. But if you sow according to the spirit, you're, you're following your, your, practicing the fruit of the spirit with your attitude and your actions and you're following his lead well that's going to have that eternal life in you it shows you one it shows you have eternal life but you're also taking that that future life that jesus has promised us you know when we are resurrected too and you're beginning to live that out right now right and so we're not to lose heart in doing good that's what he kind of how he kind of finishes this up well if you have the opportunity we're to do good to all people we're to be good to all people, to do good to everyone, especially other believers who are now, we're family, right? So we need to be doing good. Now, that was for the Galatians, and there's application for us in that as well. But what does it look like for us, you know, generally speaking, to, to follow the Spirit? Because I don't know your situation, and you don't know my situation, you know, Everybody has something specific that God can tell them to do, some ways to improve, some things to stop doing, some things to start doing, some things to do better, some periods where you just need an attitude change, that sort of thing. But generally speaking, how do we follow the Spirit? What does that look like for us to walk in step with the Spirit? Well, I got three things, and I think these are, these are important. First of all is submission to God's will and denial of self. 
You need to submit to God's will and deny your will, deny yourself. And there's several passages that kind of talk about this. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, it says this, And Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus makes it clear, if you want to follow Jesus, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God. If you want to follow God, you want to walk in Jesus' footsteps following the Spirit, guess what? you got to deny yourself and take up your cross. You know, that taking up that cross, you know, we talk about the flesh being crucified, right? So we need to put to death the old self, the, the way we were before Jesus. We need to consider that portion of part of our lives dead. Easier said than done. But we need to deny ourselves consciously, moment by moment, in every decision, and say, is this what God wants, or is this what I want? And, you know, we follow after Jesus, right? In Romans 6, verses 10 through 11, uh, Paul writes this. He's talking about, you know, what baptism symbolizes for us. He says, for the death that he died, talking about Jesus, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. When we were, when we have trusted in Jesus, we kind of experienced Jesus' uh, death, his crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection. And we will experience that full resurrection one day when we too will have resurrected bodies. But right now we're not. We're, we still exist in the flesh that we have. And so, but it's like we died with Jesus. Spiritually, we did. That old self has been crucified, has been put to death, and has been buried. And so, but Jesus was raised from the dead. He lives to God. We too should be living for God in Christ Jesus. So once again, it's that removal, it's the, taking the focus off of myself and placing it on God. It's looking to God to see what he wants, right? Romans 8, 5. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So, talking about this, you know, if we're of the flesh, we're going to set our minds on fleshly things, right? We don't have the Spirit if, if we're thinking, you know, according to the flesh. Or if we're following after the flesh, it's going to show itself in, that, in those deeds of the flesh. And our minds are going to focus on that, and we're not going to be doing God's will. We're not going to be growing spiritually or anything like that. But if we are walking according to the Spirit, if we're living according to the Spirit, if our thoughts are turned to the Holy Spirit and to, to the things of the Spirit, we're, we're, that's what we're going to be thinking about. Romans 12, 2, Paul writes, And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul has been talking to the Romans about uh, basically being a living sacrifice, you know, one that he's talking about unity there, sacrificing, you know, your individual wants and desires and you're, you know, putting yourself ahead of everybody else and thinking it as, you know, considering everybody else. And part of that is here, you know, we're not to act like the world. We're not to exhibit those deeds of the flesh. That's not the way we are to be. Instead, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, by the Holy Spirit working in us through the word of God. To, to change us and transform us so that we can be more and more like Jesus, more and more like him. And if we do that, if we're being transformed, if we're saying no to the world and no to sin and saying yes to God, following after the Spirit, we're going to show people what the will of God is. That's going to be seen and evident in our lives. And the will of God is good and acceptable and perfect. It pleases God. And that's what we'll see when we submit to his will and we deny ourselves. Now, the second thing that we can do to, to follow the Spirit's leading, to walk in step with the Spirit in our lives after submitting our will to God's will, to, to denying ourselves, is to practice virtue. Now, that might sound strange, but, but it's true. It's, you know, virtue is those things that are right, and we need to practice them. Uh, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9, we have that mental attitude bleeding into our actions. And this is what it looks like. Paul writes, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Stay there, rest there, live there. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. 
So, so Paul is writing to the Philippians and as this is in some of his closing thoughts. And he says this, you know, he's talking about don't be anxious for anything, right? Earlier. And he's like, th think about these good things. Now, Paul's not talking about positive thought or anything like that. Paul, what Paul is basically saying, though, is we need to train our minds to, to dwell on those things that are good and right and, and true, the, the virtuous things. And then we need to live them out. Because it's not enough to have it here, because if we don't have it here, it's not going to come out. But you want to walk and step and follow the Spirit and follow the Spirit's leading. That means you actually have to follow the Spirit. You actually have to practice this virtue. And Peter talks about this too. This is not just Paul. Over in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, uh, Paul, well, Peter writes, Now for this very reason also, basically, that uh, we have God's power to live for him now, to, to put away the corruption of the flesh, he says this, now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence, putting in the effort, doing this, you know, being consistent and, and habitual and, and applying yourself to this. He writes, in your faith, supply, add to moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. In your knowledge, self-control. In your self-control, perseverance. In your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. In your brotherly kindness, love. You know, Paul, uh, Peter's listing out some, talking about spiritual growth here. And he says, you know, God has provided everything that we need for godliness to grow spiritually. And so we need to apply ourselves to practice it, to, to, to do it to practice these virtues, to grow in these areas. Spiritual growth does not happen automatically, all right? And that's something that we sometimes tend to forget. We, we think that it'll happen automatically, but no. God wants us to participate in this, right? We're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We need to apply it to our lives. We need to try to live it out. We have to apply all diligence to do these things. Uh, think of it this way. Uh, a baby, if you don't feed the baby, the baby's going to die, right? You have to feed. And so that's where the Word of God comes in, the Holy Spirit and doing that sort of things. But here's the other thing. If, as you're growing up, you don't practice, you, you, don't, you don't exercise, you don't move, you, you kind of just sit there like a bump on a log, you're not going to experience growth. You'll be malnourished. You, you won't have the, the muscle mass you need or, or the, or the uh, BMI index or whatever. You just won't, you won't be growing properly. And that's the same thing in the spiritual life. It doesn't happen automatically. We got to practice virtue, right? It, has to, it starts in here with the, the Holy Spirit living and dwelling inside us. God's working in our hearts. It's got to go from here. It's got to go into here in our head. We got to dwell on these things, right? We got to have them in our head. We got to, we got to, but then it's got to go into our hands and feet. We have to live it out. If it's not being lived out, you know, Peter goes on to say the person who does not have these qualities is somebody who's forgotten what Jesus did for him, right? And so we can let the cares and worries of life mess with us distract us, uh, keep us from doing what we need to do, but we are to be growing spiritually and we have to apply ourselves to that. Not that it merits salvation because we've been saved, but if we want to experience sanctification, grow, spiritual growth, we got to discipline ourselves and we got to exercise in spiritual growth, right? right? Now, after submitting our will to God, denying ourselves, after beginning to practice virtue and, and live out the way things God wants us to live out, we have to serve one another. This is the third thing. You want to follow the Spirit. You want to walk in the Spirit steps. you got to serve one another. Galatians 5.13 talks about this. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. If we follow after our own flesh, we'll do the things that we want to do when we want to do it. And usually that will end up hurting other people, whether we recognize that or not. We might think our sins are my own, my, my sins are my own sins and, you know, it doesn't affect anybody but me, but that's wrong. Our sin, my sin affects everybody around me because it, it can affect my attitude. It can affect the way I'm talking, it can affect the way I'm thinking. It can affect, it affects the way I act. And the same is true for you. 
You know, it, sin affects other people. Now, Paul's recommendation here for kind of countering that, you know, instead of turning our freedom into that opportunity, that, that launch base, that forward operating base for sin and flesh in our life, is to not say, well, tough, everybody else should get over it. No, it's to, through love, serve one another. Love, we've already talked about that. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit, who are to serve one another. Mm-hmm. Over in Ephesians 5, 21, Paul writes that, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. You know, we see this idea in Christianity that Christianity is not about me. You know, I am not the highest in Christianity when it comes to my life. No, Jesus is, right? So if I'm living for him, I'm going to be serving others. And that's what Jesus talks about, too, in Mark 9, uh, 43 through 45. Jesus said this, though, uh, James and John had come up asking, hey, can we, you know, who's the greatest in the kingdom, that sort of thing. And the other disciples got indignant. Because they were like, hey, that's not right. What about us? And Jesus says this. He talks about the Gentiles lording it over over everybody else. He says, it is not to be this way among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Right? So, Jesus is saying, hey, greatness in God's kingdom, it's not, it's not about who's first. It's about who's serving. The servant is great because the servant is doing God's will rather than the will of the flesh. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says this, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, not yourself, think about yourself, but with humility of mind, lowliness of mind. That is, remember, humility is not thinking less of yourself it's thinking of yourself less it's putting others first it's it's recognizing your place right he says but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves do not merely look out for your own personal interests hey look out for your own personal interests but don't merely look out for that but also for the interests of others so thinking about what you want and desire that's okay as long as you recognize that you're putting it under God's, under God's will, <laughs> something startled me. You're putting it under God's will, and then you're also considering what everybody else needs too, right? We don't look out for our personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So these three things will help us to follow the Spirit, to walk by the Spirit. And so what are they again? One, deny yourself and submit yourself to God's will. Seek him, put him first. Practice virtue, living out what God says is right and good, right? Not just in your heart, not just in your head, but in your hands and feet. Live it out. And then lastly, serve one another in love. Lovingly serve one another instead of making yourself first. Serve God and serve other people. Now, to to kind of wrap this up, are you following the Spirit? If you're a believer, you are to be following the Spirit. You you have crucified the flesh with its desires and passions. And we're to, and if we live by the Spirit, Paul says, we are to walk by the Spirit. So if you have trusted in Jesus, you need to ask yourself, am I living by the Spirit? Am I following in his footsteps? Is that what I'm doing? And if there's areas in your life that are not lining up, well, we need to get that right. And I admit there are areas. I'm, it's a work in progress. Spiritual growth doesn't happen automatically, and it doesn't happen overnight. It's a lifelong process of becoming holy, of becoming godly, of becoming more and more like Jesus. And sometimes God works on things right away. And sometimes, you know, it's a slow chipping away. He's molding us. He's transforming us. The caterpillar doesn't become the butterfly overnight. That metamorphosis doesn't happen like this. It's a process, and we need to recognize that. Now, if you are an unbeliever here, if you have not trusted in Jesus to save you, but you're curious about you were curious about the fruit of the Spirit. What is people? What are people talking about when they talk about these things? Well, let me tell you this. You are still living according to your flesh. You are in sin, and sin is basically anything that does not line up with God's character, whether you do it intentionally, whether it's unintentionally. You're not lining up with God's character or His will, and you are separated from God, right? You know, God doesn't want that for you, though. He loves you, right? He wants a relationship with you. He wants to be with you, 
and you to be with him. And so he made a way. He sent his son, Jesus, who became like a servant, who, who became one of us, took on flesh, became human, who then was obedient to God and died by crucifixion on a cross. And in doing so, he was, he was the sacrifice for us. He, because of his death, he, we are now able to have a relationship with God in the sense that our sins have been taken care of. That separation that we had between God and us, Jesus took care of on the cross. And then he rose from the dead and he offers that relationship to you, eternal life. And so he says, hey, do you want this? Do you want eternal life? Do you want freedom from your sin? Do you want forgiveness? Do you want new life? Jesus is offering that to you. You have to take it, though. You have to receive it. You have to accept it. You have to trust in Jesus. There is no other way to have this deliverance from sin, to have this salvation. You have to trust in Jesus. You're a sinner. You need a Savior. And Jesus is that Savior, and there is no other way. So I, I would say this. Pray to God. Trust in Him. Trust in Jesus. Give your life to Him. Ask Him for forgiveness for your sin. Commit to following Him as your Lord, as your God. And the whole fruit of the Spirit will begin to be developed in your life. Not just as a seed that everybody has, that you even have, but as fruit that grows in abundance. And you will see a transformation begin to take place in your life because you have trusted in Jesus. If you have any questions about that, please, hey, ask them in the comments below, uh, shoot an email. I'd be glad to talk with you about that. So this is the fruit of the Spirit. This is the last video in this series. I hope you've gotten something out of it. Uh, if you have out of this video, go ahead and like it. If you think some people can benefit from this, go ahead and please share this video. Because I, I, I want you, I want each and every one of you who are watching this video to, to be growing spiritually. To, to undiscover, to recognize spiritual, uh, spiritual truth, biblical truth. Apply it to your lives and grow in Christ's likeness and holiness. And so I thank you for watching this video. God bless.